Hello, and welcome to the session on water resilience. My name is Greg Brill, and I'm a senior advisor to the UN Global Compact CEO Water Mandate and a senior researcher with the Pacific Institute. Thank you for joining us, and we hope the session will support your organization in the global efforts in developing long-term water resilience in the face of increased risks from climate change and other impacts. The session will include a short presentation for some context, followed by a discussion from UN Water, and then a facilitated dialogue with African companies and organizations supporting water resilience. Should you have any questions for the presenters or panelists throughout this session, please pop these into the chat window, and we will ask the relevant parties to make contact with you after the session. Let's start with some scene setting. The importance of water, advancing resilience with the CEO water mandate. Oftentimes we forget that only around 1% of all water on earth is readily available for human use, and not even all of this is readily available. This image shows the Aral Sea in Central Asia, which has seen increased water withdrawals for irrigation over the last 60 years. This has destroyed the local fishery and community water supply. Globally, humans withdraw about 4,000 cubic kilometers of water every year, which is triple what we withdrew 50 years ago, and withdrawals continue to increase. Global demand for water is predicted to increase by over 55% between 2000 and, and 2050. We face a growing challenge to meet all of humanity's water needs. Today, 1.7 billion people live in water-stressed areas around the world. This is where water demand outstrips supply. By 2050, that number is expected to jump to over 5 billion. But even if there is adequate water in an area, the basin can still experience water stress due to pollution. Nearly all human uses of water, including agricultural, industrial, and municipal uses, result in water pollution. 2 million tons of sewerage and industrial and agricultural waste are discharged into the world's water every single day. Currently, over 80% of the world's wastewater is discharged back into rivers, streams, and oceans without any treatment. This causes widespread damage to ecosystems and contamination of critical human water sources. Access to clean water is always crucial for the health of individuals and families. But in the era of COVID-19, access to hand washing is crucial to stop the spread of the pandemic. Worldwide, 2.5 billion people lack access to improved sanitation, more than one third of the world's population. As of 20, uh, 2017, 2.2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water. And over 800,000 children younger than five years of age die from diarrhea each year, often caused by inadequate wash facilities, according to UNICEF. For the past seven years, the water crises has been in the top global risks published by the World Economic Forum. Many of the other risks are either directly influenced by or impact water, which increases both the likelihood and impact of current and future water crises. And climate change is also already increasing um, and creating water crises. And we are seeing increased intensity of water-related natural events like droughts and floods, and this trend is expected to continue. This chart from National Geographic shows the dramatic increase of worldwide catastrophic events linked to climate. Globally, climate change effects will cause more than 4.2 trillion US dollars of damage to assets as a conservative estimate. This figure is three times higher under extreme scenarios. But enough of the doom and gloom, we can change these scenarios and build long-term water resilience. The UN Global Compact Water Stewardship Commitment Platform is for both business, uh, for, for both leaders and learners. The commitment to action, access resources, and, and, and collaborate with local and global partners. And this allows for deeper engagement via an action platform and the Water Resilience Coalition. This slide shows logos from a few of the mandate endorsers from around the world. So by being here and being part of the mandate, you're in very good company. Endorsers commit to improve their operations across six key commitment areas. Every year, endorsers report on their efforts to the mandate and stakeholders across these commitment areas. The mandate initiatives address many water issues, including nature-based solutions, which evaluate approaches to resilient climate and water solutions for businesses, 
Wash for Work, which helps businesses improve access to water, sanitation, and hygiene, both in the workplace and at home, across the supply chain and in communities. Water Resilience Accounting Framework, uh, Water Resilience Accounting Framework, rather, uh, is developing a consistent, simple framework for water accounting across context and scale. And finally, Target Setting Work seeks to improve contextual target setting across water. Separate from the Action Platform is the Mandate's Water Resilience Coalition. This initiative aims to preserve the, waters, uh, the world's fresh water resources in the face of climate change through collective action in water stress basins by setting concrete, measurable targets to achieve by 2050. The Mandate also hopes to develop and host many resources and publications. These are just a selection of a few of them. In addition, the Mandate holds webinars, events and conferences to engage, learn and promote water resilience globally. So join us in building long-term water resilience. Thank you. So I'll now hand over to Kelly Ann Naylor, Vice uh, Chair of Water, of oh, sorry, uh, the United Nations Water. Kelly Ann will be speaking to the interconnections between climate and water and the need to build resilient water systems in response to climate and other shocks, such as the current pandemic. Kelly Ann will also highlight some key messages from the UN's report on water and climate, as well as the opportunities for action through the SDG 6 acceleration framework. Kelly Ann, over to you. Great, thank you so much. And really, um, let me first very much thank uh, UN Global Compact and CEO Water Mandate for organizing this timely session today. Um, and as you said, I'm very pleased to be able to speak about Sustainable Development Goal 6 on water and sanitation in my capacity as the Vice Chair of UN Water. Um, which for those of you who um, haven't heard of UN Water, it's a coordination mechanism in the UN for all water and sanitation related issues. And this mechanism has grown out of many years of collaboration between UN agencies, funds and programs, because there's no single entity in the UN that specializes on water. Um, water itself and its many uses um, runs across many areas of the UN's work and many of the, of the UN agencies um, come together through UN Water to be able to um, link with partners on the issue of water. Um, so as it's already been said, um, this um, global pandemic has, has, has even more highlighted the fact that access to water and sanitation is more critical than ever before. And I think it's also very much highlighted um, the deep neglect um, that, has, that has taken place in ensuring access to water and sanitation um, for all both as um, an opportunity to ensure public health, but also um, as something that, that builds more um, climate resilience going forward. And I think right now when we're looking at the types of um, climate changes and ecosystem shocks, um, many of the changes in climate, um, the way that this will impact people is felt through water. Um, and coming back to the report that was published um, earlier this year, the World Water Report, um, we identified that even before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, more than 2 billion people lived in countries experiencing high water stress. Um, and when we look at the greatest water consumers of all, it's um, agriculture, which of course accounts for nearly 70% of these fresh water withdrawals globally, um, and which can even go up to 90% in some of the most um, arid countries. And of course, um, as we've heard, the effects of climate change are making water more scarce and more unpredictable. Um, in areas through floods, drought, saline intrusion, desertification, and soil erosion um, are all wreaking havoc in different uh, parts of the world and contribute and can trigger the displacement um, ultimately of up to millions of people. So as we look at these um, impacts on changes of, of climate, um, we need to also look at the impacts um, on uh, public health. And I think we've already highlighted those that we still have um, uh, particularly if we look at Africa, 800 million Africans without safe drinking water um, and more than 700 million people don't have access to basic sanitation. 
So these are quite staggering um, numbers, which we know will, of course, also be compacted um, by urbanization and particularly fast growing small towns um, where the, the population is predicted to grow by more than half a billion um, by 2050. So um, it's really in this context um, that UN Water um, members and partners um, came together to put together what is called the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework. Um, and this um, Global Acceleration Framework um, was launched at the High Level Political Forum in July 2020 um, and was developed by UN Water, which has over 33 members and 42 partners um, that, that came together to identify what is it that is going to be needed most to be able to accelerate progress on um, the SDG 6 target to water and sanitation over the next 10 years, which in the UN we call the decade of action leading up to 2030. Um, so this framework is going to emphasize a new way that we can all come together, governments, United Nations systems, civil society, and the private sector, um, to be able to accelerate progress on this um, global goal. And in this um, acceleration framework, which you can find on our website, um, we have identified five key accelerators, and these accelerators are not, you know, magic recipes um, of what to do, but they are specific things that have been identified for the water and sanitation sector to be able to accelerate progress. So the first of these uh, global accelerators is the financing accelerator. Um, and, you know, of course, kind of behind the changes that are needed, um, increases in allocations of funding and financing will be critical, um, but it's not only more resources, it's also improved targeting, better use of these resources, um, together with mobilization of domestic resources and international funding and financing that will ultimately lead to more efficient and effective service delivery and implementation. The second um, of the accelerators is data and information. Um, and I think all of us who work in, 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 um, in really any area, um, but particularly um, in the water sector, know that there's a critical lack of data and in, in even understanding the availability of water resources, the rate of depletion and their renewability. So in order to be able to tackle these challenges, we must have credible data it's, it's an opportunity to bring, um, build trust between populations, leaders, and ultimately helps us make the most um, evidence-based informed decisions that can also bring about increased accountability. The third accelerator is that we must have sufficient capacity. Um, and, you know, I think all of us know that human resources are um, a critical and precious key to success. Um, and specifically what we have seen in the water and sanitation sector is a need to have more inclusive human and institutional capacities to really help us improve the quality of services, to operate and maintain technologies, um, and also an opportunity to create more professional jobs in the water sector and retain a skilled workforce on sanitation. So we think this can also be a great employment opportunity for high value um, jobs on, on water and sanitation. The fourth accelerator is governance, um, and we must look at how we can build inclusive and effective institutions to make achieving SDG 6 everyone's business. Um, and the fifth accelerator, which I think is particularly um, pertinent um, for, this off, for this audience is innovation. Um, and I think it's very much um, uh, evident that to solve these new challenges that we're facing, we will need to work and operate in new ways. Um, and this means that innovation, whether it's um, in areas of science, emerging technology, business models, um, all of these are really needed and can make a significant improvement um, in the efficiency and effectiveness and cost effectiveness of water and sanitation 
management. And so as we really focus on scaling up um, best practices, we need to identify these innovations um, that can quickly help countries, regions, and even globally to be able to um, move forward with, with more innovative practices and technologies um, to help um, countries, especially those that are the furthest behind, to get on top of um, uh, you know, tackling these, these challenges. So if you bring these five um, accelerators together, these can really have a multiplier effect for achieving SDG 6. And um, we know, of course, that water contributes um, to so many development objectives that are part of the 17 global goals, whether it's education, gender equality, um, better health, better nutrition. Um, all of these areas very much um, depend on um, the way that we use and manage um, water and, and sanitation. So, um, you know, very specifically looking at the private sector, um, when we look at this accelerator framework, we see so many ways that the private sector can be a critical partner um, in accelerating SDG 6. I think first and foremost, the private sector is a critical engine for investments, innovations, um, new development, research and development of new technologies, and very much like the conversation we're going to have today around engaging business to act responsibly as a partner in a multi-stakeholder partnership um, approach. Um, the second one is I think we, we, we look to business leaders to be able to demonstrate leadership to take action to support water and sanitation, and that this offers a, a great potential to accelerate the pace of change through the leadership of CEOs and other private sector leaders. Um, lastly, many of you might know that the 19th of November, one of my favorite days, um, is the World Toilet Day. Um, and the theme of this year's World Toilet Day was sustainable sanitation and climate change. Um, and I think when people first think about this topic, you may struggle to, to make the connections, but through the work that we've done, we've really identified how the effects of climate change threaten all aspects of water, of sanitation and hygiene infrastructure, but also the services of sanitation that can be um, definitely negatively impact if you have water scarcity, so insufficient water for sanitation, or you have flooding events where sanitation um, systems and services um, can be um, can cause releases of um, untreated human waste um, into public spaces and, and the environment. So definitely also wanted to say that it's not just about water, but it's also about these elements of SDG 6 that link to um, sanitation. And you may have seen we launched, um, UNICEF and WHO launched a report called the State of the World Sanitation. So if you want to read more about this, um, you can find it. So um, colleagues and friends, this meeting could not have come at a better time. We need today your ambition, your vision, and most of all, we need to act together um, for a secure and sustainable water future for all. So thank you so much um, for inviting you and water here today. And I really look forward to hear your perspectives and how we can work together um, between um, the public sector, private sector, um, and other stakeholders. So thank, thank you very much. And Greg, back uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly Ann. I mean, that was fascinating. And I think many of those in, in the public and private sectors that are on the call with us today will certainly relate to many of the accelerators and the points that you raised um, and are trying to address many of these within their own governments and organizations as well. So thank you for that. The session is going to shift gears somewhat uh, with a facilitated dialogue, which will happen now. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our panelists today. Evelyn Mere, the country director of Water Age Nigeria, uh, and Ezekiel Sekele, Legal and Corporate Affairs Director at Zambrian Breweries. So our panel is going to be asked a series of questions over the next 20 to 25 minutes. And to start, I'd like each panelist to take two minutes to please introduce themselves and answer the following question. Why is water an important issue for your company or organization? And how are you approaching resilience? Evelyn, perhaps we can ask you to put on your camera 
while you're on the panel as well. So again, the question, why is water an important issue for your company and organization, and how are you approaching resilience? If you can start by introducing yourselves and then taking two minutes to answer that question, please. Evelyn, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you very much, Greg. My camera is on. For some reason, my, my picture is in, my, uh, my face isn't showing. But uh, thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm delighted to be here to join the conversation to explore innovative solutions to drive practical actions on the sustainable development goals. Water is important to water aid. I mean, as our name says, this is what we do. Uh, we exist to make sure that the most marginalized and uh, hard to reach populations are given access to water, um, sanitation and hygiene to enable them improve their living standards, to enable them exit poverty, and to really just survive. Without water, uh, people can't live. If people drink contaminated water, um, they, they fall ill, they are unproductive, they cannot contribute to anything, and ultimately a lot of people die. So water is very key to what it is that we're doing. And um, looking at the Nigerian context, water aid in Nigeria is pursuing water resilience in a, in a lot of different ways. Our strategy has three key pillars. We're looking at uh, strengthened sector and systems able to deliver sustainable services. Uh, we're looking at building partnerships that enable collaboration between different sector actors to deliver uh, improved and expanded services to all and you know, accelerate to 2030 with universal access. And then most important of all, we empower citizens to demand um, better services from government, but also giving them that responsibility to play their role by number one, uh, paying for water to make sure you know services are sustainable, and then also adopting good hygiene behaviors to make sure that they, they they act as responsible citizens that do not waste water, and then you know ensure they wash their hands at critical times and do not defecate in the open. A lot of the work we do around uh, water resilience is really just looking at the context in Nigeria and seeing ways in which we can transform the challenges into huge opportunities. And we bring in private sector to play a key role in that. I'm going to look at a few of them. To increase uh, um, water resilience, I will start by looking at the sanitation situation in Nigeria. As you are aware, water is an enabler of hygiene and sanitation. Without water, it will have major crises you know, with, with, with sanitation and hygiene. Nigeria, we have a crisis situation where 46 million people are defecating in the open. Um, about 112 million households do not have access to decent toilets. And then you have a situation where COVID is happening and 162 million people are unable to wash their hands. That's a disaster waiting to happen. But you can also flip it and look at how you can transform this into opportunities. So, the, the open defecation issue leads to contamination of water sources. And then we have a problem as well where looking at the sanitation service chain, there is no framework for fecal sludge management. So you have containment in some places and then you're having fecal sludge being collected and dumped in water sources, leading to compounding an already uh, a problematic, problematic situation where 60 million people do not have access to clean water. So what we're doing, first of all, is to engage government to set the policy direction. And the government, Nigerian government has done that by develop, the, first of all, declaring a state of emergency, you know, looking at the issue, the picture I just painted, and then developing a national wash action plan for the revitalization of the wash sector. And there are five key pillars that we are working with the government to make sure that they are translated from policy to practice. You're looking at sanitation as an issue. You're looking at um, sustainability. You're looking at funding and financing, monitoring and evaluation, and then you know using this to address issues. So focusing on the sanitation pillar, which is of course linked to water, what we do is uh, to make sure that we get toilets into households. Of course, those who do not have house uh, toilets in their households are the poor, you know, who do not have uh, the resources to put toilets in their homes or are living in rented facilities where there are no there are no sanitation facilities. So we're working with the government to make sure that this situation is changed and then bringing in private sector to pay, play a key role as well. Working with the government, we, there has been a launch of a Clean Nigeria campaign, Use the Toilet. We have translated this to the level of the state by launching, in addition, the Clean Family campaign. Of course, in doing this, we, are, we already were working with the states to make sure that what access to water is expanded and then you know, building on that to get households to buy 
toilet. So the Clean Family Campaign addresses the human person to say, what will be your motivation to stop def defecating in the open? Because if you keep defecating in the open, the entire community is, is in effect drinking its own shit in water. So that Clean Family Campaign is, is happening now, linked to the Clean Nigeria Campaign launched by the federal government. And then we're bringing in the private sector, such as Lixil and a company called Innocent, to say you can make, you know, you can make a contribution to this by you know, uh, producing affordable toilets that are aspirational, and then you know, getting households to buy them. So in this collaboration, we're trying to transform that issue of widespread poor access to sanitation by working with the private sector and government to make sure the open defecation and the dumping of fecal sludge do not continue to stress water resilience by contaminating water sources. So that right. is one of the things that we're looking at. And then All we're right. working with companies to make sure that uh, they are adopting water use efficiency. We're working with Diageo and uh, uh, Coca-Cola in their water replenishment programs to make sure communities where they work have water replenished in the quantities that have been abstracted and make sure there are no water shortages. We're also working right. with regulatory authorities to make sure that regulation is happening to manage water abstraction, make sure tariffs are managed, make sure there's non-revenue non water uh, is happening, and then the man effective management of wastewater. There are a few more things, but I'll just stop here for now. Thank you. Thanks, Evelyn, for that. Um, you know, you've certainly jumped ahead with a number of and answered a number of the questions that I had for you as well, but hopefully we can revisit those uh, in the next few minutes as well. Ezekiel, if I can hand over to you for a quick two minute introduction of yourself and then to answer the question, why is water an important issue for your organization and how are you approaching resilience? Over to you. Thanks so very much to you, the, the UNGC. Thank you so much to you, Greg and Denise and, and, and the team. I am Ezekiel Sekele, the Legal and Corporate Affairs Director at ABMB of Zambia, at Zambian uh, Breweries PLC. Indeed, it's a pleasure, a huge pleasure for me, uh, Greg and team, uh, for me to be able to share with you how we are making global goals local business. And for us at AB InBev, we are solidly committed to ensuring that we make a positive contribution to the global, regional, and country water agenda. Why do I say this? Water is life, as we all know. But beyond that, when we come to ABMB, we also say that water is business. Water is business. We cannot have any of our favorite beverages without water. No water, no beer, full stop. But beyond that, at ABMB, we're also saying, when we talk about water, water is about leadership. Water is about ownership. We are all owners, we feel part of this business. And with the current climatic challenges that we do have, we have seen increasingly pressures, increased pressure on water sources. And that requires us to work together. And if we talk about our purpose, our purpose is about bringing people together for a better world bringing people together for a better world. That's our purpose. But we do understand that for us to be able to bring people together for a better world, even at a time when we cannot physically meet because of the health challenges that we are experiencing globally, but we still want to meet and bring people together, even if we are doing it at a distance. And that's why we are committed to ensuring that issues of sustainability are part of the business agenda on a daily basis. From the global business leadership, from our CEO, Brita Carlos, to everyone down through at regional country level, we are all leaders and owners when it comes to sustainability. So for us, if we talk about bringing people together for a better world, um, great. 
I, I think that we're doing that through supporting our communities because we know that uh, our community is this, this is where our employees reside in these communities and it is incumbent upon us to ensure that we positively contribute to these communities to ensure that there is sustainability as we work and interact with these communities because we want this business to be there not for 10 years but for the next 10 years for this business to outlive us the current crop of leaders who are in this business for the future generations and that's why sustainability is is very important but beyond that we are a global brewer and for us we brew the finest beverages globally but for us to be able to produce the finest beverages globally we need to ensure that we have healthy and thriving communities we have healthy and thriving environment so for that objective to be attained we have to be active participants ensuring that the communities in which we operate they are thriving so in short water for us is key water is so important to our business because without water we cannot even be there as ABMB. and we realize that this water resource it's there as a shared resource we want to water ourselves but at the same time we ensure that the communities in which we are operating also do have access to clean quality water and that's why when we begin to talk about issues of water for us leadership is important at an individual level but also at a group level but beyond that as we push that agenda sustainability is, is, is so key and answering your second question on how are you building resiliency for us sustainability is part of the business on on a day-to-day -day basis and we do have the sustainability goals for 2025 so we've given ourselves an agenda between now and 2025 to ensure that we deliver on the promises on the commitments that our leaders within the business have made to the global family to the united nations and for us as the leaders who are driving this agenda we're ensuring that sustainability where we are focusing on a number of objectives i can mention six of them we're focusing on water stewardship we're focusing on smart agriculture not only agriculture but smart agriculture ensuring that we include the use of technology as part of our agenda on agriculture we are also talking about circular packaging recycling it's very important for us to participate to work with the communities to work with the ngos to work with the government ensuring that that which we put in society the post consumer solid waste there is a way for them to come back and also for us continually thinking about it being innovative in terms of the materials that we are using for packaging beyond that we are also focusing more more and more on issues of climate action and i'm delighted to be part of this forum that is talking about water and also through water management also we talk about climate action entrepreneurship is key for us and then finally because we're a brewer we are responsible we want to be part of the agenda in terms of promoting smart drinking to ensure that uh, our consumers consume our favorite beverages that they do buy from us in moderation but in a responsible manner so this agenda of sustainability we have been pushing it proud covid 19 and i'm talking about proud covid 19 because as we push the agenda of resiliency i want to talk about three phases before covid 19 which is 2020 and beyond 2020 and where we are in 2020 where we do have this COVID-19. So proud COVID-19, we were pushing sustainability agenda. For us, we were doing it religiously. But I also want to say that 
matters pertaining to sustainability vis-a-vis -vis sustainable development goals, where we talk about the 17 goals, and out of those 17 goals, us as AB Imbel, we've really pushed ourselves hard in terms of pushing the agenda on 14 SDGs. And those goals that we are pushing, whether we're talking about reducing poverty, supporting no hunger initiatives, ensuring that our, our businesses, our communities in which we operate, they have good water, there is sanitation, and not only just good water, safe water, you know, good quality water, so that ourselves we produce uh, better products, but also we aid those communities in which we are operating. We've been pushing this agenda religiously, but it's not only for us to tick the box in 2025 to prove to the rest of the world that we have done it. At AB Imbev, we believe that it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to be sustainable. And we need really, and, 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 and I'm trying to be very careful here, we need the SDGs to push the agenda forward. But still, we believe that within ourselves, we don't need anyone to come and tell us that do this because, you know, supporting equality, you know, pushing partnerships, pushing sustainability, you know, doing all those things, those are the right things to do. And we've just realized that actually, whatever we've been doing, it's in support of the SDGs. And that's why we are excited to work with all well-meaning organizations and partners on this agenda of SDGs. And for us at AAB Imbel, we believe it's the right thing to do because without sustainability, there is no business. And once I spoke about sustainability, Greg, we've been able to sustain ourselves this year. We've been able to bounce back. Yes, we've faced challenges globally, but we've seen to it that We've been able to come back, particularly in quarter three and now in quarter four, most of our businesses are able to come back, are able to produce, are able to support communities, are able to drive the SDGs agenda because we're doing the right thing. And COVID-19 has taught us one thing. If you do your SDGs religiously, if you do the right thing, resiliency is automatic. Resilience will come in. And for us, I think we're excited to see to it that COVID-19 has shown to us that you do the right thing, your business will be strong. And through that, we'll be able to contribute positively to the next decade, the decade of, of, of action, where by 2030, we all want to be aligned to deliver that goal of SDGs to ensure that all the goals by 2030 we have achieved it. And for us at ABM, we're excited. And for us at, at, at ABM, particularly in Zambia, where I'm operating, we have partnerships and obviously following SDG number 17, you know, Partnership for Sustainable Development. We are working with a number of um, stakeholders, the government, NGOs, and also some global organizations like WWF, to mention a few, through which together we've managed to also come up with initiatives at a community level, where, for example, at one of our sites in Indola, we have supported a protection of a site where we do draw and extract water at the uh, water spring site. We've built houses for about 28 families, pushed them away from where they were beginning to encroach and impact on the water source through which we were able to get water for ourselves and for the community. In Osaka, we're also doing uh, the same, where one of our communities near our business and with the support of AB Imbel, our global organization, where we've received funding, we've managed to build an industrial water bowl for the community. At the time, saying social distance, wash your hands, use hand sanitizers. But if people can't, there's no water for people to wash their hands. What, what would that mean? It will mean more and more um, health impacts for our people. So for us, we've been tapping into all these openings where we want to help the community. In turn, we're helping ourselves. In turn, we're helping our employees. And we believe that we cannot do all this on our own. Partnerships are key for us. We've been and we are and we'll continue to, to drive those partnerships forward. So in short, I think SDGs are a great tool 
for building resilience. And we've been able to bounce back. And I'm proud to say that we, we have, we've been able to bounce back because we've been following SDGs religiously and also implementing them. Anyone who is not implementing the SDGs religiously and doing the right thing, it will show in the results. The companies will not be able to start. And I think for us, we've been doing the right thing and we shall continue to do the right thing and we shall continue to partner with all well-meaning organizations and, and I'm happy to be with you on this uh, platform. Great. great, thank you. Thank you so That's much, Ezekiel. You, you um, did a great job in answering many of the other questions that I had, and the two that I was going to pose to you are, what is the business case for water resilience uh, for companies in Africa? And you, 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 you certainly spoke to that quite a bit, which was fantastic, so thank you. And I hope the, the audience got many of those points as well. And then the second question I was going to ask, are what are the main business opportunities for collaboration in the region? And you spoke very strongly to partnerships and the need to bring in broad engagement with communities, with other government entities, with other players in the sector, with NGOs, science, et cetera. Um, we've got a few more minutes before we're going to close the session. So I'd like to ask one question to Evelyn very quickly. And Evelyn, if you can answer this in two minutes, I'd be much uh, appreciative of that. Uh, and Ezekiel spoke to it quite a bit around the SDG agenda, specifically SDG 6. And the question is, how can companies, policy leaders and science better work together to advance the SDG, uh, SDG agenda in Africa? So Evelyn, if I can pass that question over to you for a quick two minutes, and then we'll have to close the session. Thank you very much. I, I already started talking about some of that. Um, I looked at transforming sanitation challenges, the huge sanitation challenges we have in the continent and in my country, Nigeria, into opportunities by businesses investing in sanitation products and sanitation marketing and working with government, civil society and communities to ensure uptake. It becomes a win-win in the long run because uh, the, these communities become healthier, business is able to make profit, government is able to advance its policy plans, and then civil society is able to meet its strategic objectives. They can also look at the issue of uh, partnering with regulatory authorities. Regulatory authorities determine how water is abstracted, how it is produced and supplied, and the management of uh, wastewater and um, Evelyn, we seem to have lost you for a second there. Evelyn, are you still there? I think we've lost Evelyn for a second. Well, it comes to the point of the session uh, to close. So in closing, I'd, I'd like to thank the panelists um, for their time, as well as Kelly Ann for the presentation discussion that we had with her. And I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists to make one clear call to action. So what is that one takeaway from the session that you hope the participants can identify with or use or take forward to drive water resilience? So perhaps we can start with you, Ezekiel, and hopefully we'll get Evelyn back. Um, so again, what is that one takeaway from the session that you hope the participants can identify with or use or take forward? We'll start with you, Ezekiel. Thank you, Greg. Uh Thank you, Greg. I would like to start by saying that, um, and this is a, a quote that is usually said, it says that if climate change was a shark, then water will be the teeth. Imagine, would we want to suffer the negative impacts of climate change, the, the droughts on the rest of humanity, on communities, on, on industry? For us to be able to overcome that, please let us work together. Partnerships for sustainable development, it's key. And each one of us being a leader in terms of pushing forward the agenda for water security. We've only got one world to save, and this is the Mother Earth. And we have learned a lot from COVID-19 in terms of the impacts and also the opportunities that it has brought to us. As a people, we have a strong spirit within ourselves to work together and let's push the agenda for the decade of action as we move to 2030. So I just call for partnership, I just call for leadership that may we continue to work together. Thank you. Great.
Thank you so much. Kelly Ann, perhaps I could pose the same question to you, if you wouldn't mind uh, answering that one. What is the one takeaway from the session that you hope the participants can identify with or use or take forward to drive water resilience? Thanks so much. And it's hard to top Ezekiel's quote, um, but I was thinking of one um, that, that kind of resonated with me, which is, um, you know, go fast, go alone, um, go, go far, go together. Um, and I think for me, what I really took away and, and, and listening um, to the two panelists was really about how um, there are multiple values of water. Um, and um, but when we can work together and, and manage water um, across all of these uses in ways that focus on resilience and sustainability, um, that this will really, um, as, a, as a global community, as a local community, um, and as individuals who are also um, very much made up of water, um, we will really be able to um, chart out a, a pathway um, that will lead um, our world in the direction that we want to go. And I think a lot about, um, uh, you know, how, um, water and, and, and climate change are such intergenerational issues. Um, and, you know, that, 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 and that the work that we are doing today um, is something that is not going to only make the lives better um, for our generation and our children today, but all of the future generations um, of children to, to come. And so building um, stable and resilient societies, um, sustainable businesses. I mean, this is going to bring all of these development um, benefits um, in the in the long term. So I found it to be a very inspiring uh, conversation. So thanks so much to be here and, and really, yeah, looking forward to taking this all forward together. Thank you. Thank Fast you so much, and far. <laughs> Fast and far. That's a great way to, to close the session. And I think um, the key points for me that have come out of this is, is around partnership building and knowing that water isn't just the the mandate of one organization one company that it needs to be the focus of far broader communities um corporations governments and they need to be speaking the same language and so ultimately it's it's around pushing the agenda item up to um to really high up, up on the agenda so water needs to be the key focus of organizations companies policists um scientists academics etc uh, and we need to solve um, these key societal challenges together. So thank you for joining us at the session on water resilience. Uh, we hope the session provided key lessons, some information which will be helpful to you uh, and your organization. Uh, please um, feel free to join the remaining sessions today and, and take part in the discussions around making global goals local business in Africa. So thank you and goodbye.